Good morning all. Uh, today is Wednesday morning once again and we are together to reflect on the Word of the Lord in a short message that can remind us of once again who we are and where we are going in life. Before we start, let us pray. Father God, it's indeed a privilege to share time around your Word and to be guided by the Holy Spirit in the things we do and say. So Lord, we pray that you be with us in this time and that we are guided by the Holy Spirit so that we may hear closer, Lord, and we may hear clearer the things that you need to say to us this day. Be with us in this time. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray this, giving thanks. Amen. This month was Heritage Month. And in South Africa, the theme for Heritage this year was reclaiming, restoring, and celebrating our living heritage. Now, Heritage Month recognizes aspects of the South African culture, which are both tangible and intangible. Things like creative expression, in music and performances, our historical inheritance, our languages, the food we eat, as well as popular memory. Now, the liberation heritage of South Africa is characterized by people's identification with the particular spaces and places shaped by our historical events and collective memory. But what is heritage? Well, heritage is defined as a person's unique, I want to I want to emphasize unique, inherited sense of family identity, the values, the traditions, the culture, and the artifacts handed down by previous generations. Now, there's very, very various heritage sites in South Africa, and they are normally these days named after liberation struggle icons. We've got the Solpai, Solpai municipality in the Northern Cape, Nelson Mandela Museum in the Eastern Cape, uh, the Shaka Zulu Airport in uh, KwaZulu Natal, the Oliver Tambu Airport in Gauteng, and so we can carry on. Now, the South African government sees the liberation heritage as a part of our cultural heritage of South Africa. Now, what does this mean? Government has decided and has asked the communities and South Africans to focus on four things during this month and the coming year. Now, firstly, the first two I just want to just quick go over quickly and the other the next two I want to maybe focus on a bit deeply. The liberation heritage is about the preservation of history, of the struggle against imperialism, col colonialism and other oppressive and repressive systems in our society. And then government calls on all sectors to use liberation heritage as a vehicle to foster social cohesion, nation building, economic development and inclusive citizenship. But then thirdly, they say our liberation heritage, liberation heritage was forged in the theater of struggle that shaped the new South Africa and can be actively used to contribute to the revival of social, and that's social would include our complete lives, and political consciousness across the country. And there has to be political consciousness because this is a government effort. Fourthly, they call upon all South Africans to promote a national identity that is self-conscious of its liberation heritage, which will in turn serve to promote unity and diversity among all sectors of South Africa. Now, the last two points here, or goals of the government, is less political. Although they do talk about a political consciousness, but it focuses on people and how do you liberate people and how do you pull the nation together. Now, tomorrow is a public holiday in South Africa and it celebrates the month-long focus on heritage. Not many of any of our leaders that is across the spectrum, being either political, religious, business, social or otherwise, will dedicate this day to the Christian heritage of our country. Our government can profess and call on this nation as much as they like to establish a so-called liberation heritage. We can ask the question, will such an approach be viable and prove to be successful? Well, only time will tell. The focus and the point of departure from government is based in politics of the day, and rightly so, as that is why they are politicians and are governing. Looking at the government's four points of call to action, a political solution is required because that is all they have and can see and can consider. It appears from South Africa's history that we remain a nation that struggles and that freedom remains elusive and impossible. Over ages and through the study of human behavior and belief systems, psychology, theology, anthropology, sociology, criminology, and a host more of other ologies, 
has demonstrated time and time again to us that humans believe what they are taught and what they are told, and that from when they are little. We appear to be no different than the animals used in Pavlov's experiment of classical conditioning or the taming of elephants. Liberation and struggle seem to be the core focus of the government of the day. Sadly, it all seems a bit hopeless. The best intention and effort lack genuineness. It all looks unrealistic and echoes an emptiness when the clapper of truth is brought against it. Being critical of an honest attempt at boosting heritage could be viewed by some as uncalled for and unfair. So what is the alternative? Let's look at the reminder of heritage. I invite you to join me in the reading of Scripture, and especially 1 Thessalonians 1, and then also 1 Thessalonians 4, a couple of verses. So let us read. I read from the NIV. 1 Thessalonians 1, I read, Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Those are the three authors of this letter. To the Church of Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before God and our Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the first three verses of 1 Thessalonians. I then go to 1 Thessalonians verse 5, of chapter 5, <clears throat> and I go to verse 8. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. Now I only read so thus far. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> now most of the New Testament scholars believe that this is where it all began. Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians is the earliest of all his letters. If they are right, and very little exists to prove otherwise, then with great certainty it is the oldest script that we have in the New Testament. The writer of this letter is Paul, although two co-authors appear in Silvanus and Timothy. Enough evidence exists to ascribe the letter to Paul. What was it like to be a Christian in the very early days? Answering this question becomes an exercise in heritage. What Paul sets out to do is remind the people of Thessalonica what it meant to be a Christian. Historically, the country now known as Greece consisted of two regions, Macedonia in the north and Achaia in the south. The cities of Thessalonica, which was the capital, and Philippi were in the north, and Athens, <coughs> excuse me, Athens and Corinth in the south. Now Thessalonica was a metropolis with a population as high as 100,000 and as per archaeological findings housed a wide variety of religious groupings, very much like South Africa today. Shrines and temples for the deities of Isis, which was the mother uh, Egyptian protector mother goddess, Osiris, the brother of Isis, was an Egyptian god of the underworld, Serapis was an invented god that uh, existed way into the Ptolemaic area. Uh, era and into the Roman period. These were all gods that you found in Thessalonica. So it wasn't this, this little huddle of Christians. No, they were exposed to other th religions, beliefs, cultures, and heritages. That's from these gods that the converts to Paul's message turned. So they, they turned from Isis, they turned from Osiris, they turned from Serapis, and some of the other gods that existed in that time. So it's striking that Paul remind them of their true heritage. He reminds them of things they already know. In no less than 15 occasions, Paul reminds them of the Christian heritage. The question arises as to why Paul reminded the Thessalonians of the heritage. <clears throat> One of the reasons offered, and surely the most compelling, is that as a community they suffered the shame of being reviled by their own compatriots. In Thessalonians 2, 14, 15, we read, <clears throat> sorry, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 14 and 15, we read, For you, brothers, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own countrymen the same things those churches suffered from the Jews, who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and also drove us out. <clears throat> they, disple they displease God and are hostile to all men. 
It is in times of rejection and scorn that we are in need of being most reminded of what our heritage is. Reflecting on Paul's reminder to the Thessalonians provides us with an opportunity to step back and once again look at our own heritage. What is our heritage as Christians? And how do we live out our heritage in South Africa today? <clears throat> Let's look at our Christian heritage. One of the most famous portions of Scripture is surely 1 Corinthians 13, 13, the ode to love. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. This is, however, not the first time that Paul uses the Christian Virtue Ethic Trilogy. The trilogy is found in the beginning and at the end of 1 Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 3 we read, We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 8 of 1 Thessalonians 5 we read, But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. Early on we identified this letter to the Thessalonians as the first of any of the letters preserved for us, and that it is most probably written before any of the New Test other New Testament books, which in my mind makes it an artifact of inheritance and a cornerstone of our Christian heritage. In a recent academic proposal, the Virtue Ethic Trilogy of Faith, Hope and Love was built into a model for the restoration of morality in South Africa. The main and most challenging question at the end of the study was, whose responsibility is it to restore morality in South Africa, and who should be guiding it? Needless to say, that the church, society, and especially Christians, and also business and government, <clears throat> have a role to play. Being a secular state, however, doesn't make this easy. It makes it more challenging and complex. Ultimately, it boils down to the Christian in South Africa, the Christian in her or his household, school, university, workplace, social and political environment. We are not professing a church state, but rather a state that will acknowledge and have the courage of its conviction to be led by scripture that we find in 2 Chronicles 7.14, where God says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, and I will heal their land. Yet to wait for the state and the changing constitution is going to be a very, very long wait. And this is quite actually a dichotomy, because in our constitution, we call upon God, the God of Israel, to protect this country. So how do we live our Christian heritage? When Paul reminds the Christians in Thessalonica of faith, hope, and love, he places hope lost. This is in contrast to the 1 Corinthians 13 script, where love is placed last. The placing at the, end of, at the end renders a greater significance and focus to the element. Hope is the most important to the Christians and the church in Thessalonica at, the, at that time. Paul received a good report from Timothy with regards to the faith and love of the Thessalonian church. We read that in 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 6. Hope seemed to have dwindled. And as was the case with the Thessalonians, they were famous for their faith, and they abounded in love, but they needed to be encouraged in hope. It would appear that as South Africans, we need encouragement in all three of these elements. The state of our nation is sadly deflated of love. The recent upsurge in communities looking out for each other during the heyday of the pandemic is faltering. There seem to be more robberies and murders than before in the COVID-19 than before the COVID-19 pandemic struck. Faith abounded, and people, irrespective of their religion orientation, were speaking about faith being the one element that could pull us through as a nation. This seemed to have grown cold. Grown cold. Hope was on every second person's lips amidst the time of the fiercest trial, but now it's barely uttered. We would do well to take heed of the words from Paul that says, put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Very crudely defined, the trilogy of Christian virtue ethics can be defined as faith is the boy who takes an umbrella to a prayer meeting for rain. 
love is that we still marry despite the high divorce rates. Hope, we set our alarm clocks every night expecting to be awakened by it the next morning. For us as Christians to make a meaningful difference in our country at this time requires that we will have the courage and be open to the leading of the Holy Spirit to live daily and act our, our, <clears throat> in our lives the faith that the perfecter of our faith installed in us, that is by the grace of His Father God. To love with a love that surpasses all understanding and are based in the peace of our Lord. Practically, it is as simple as doing the right thing for as many people as we possibly can and not evaluating and judging everybody's possible motives and actions. Thirdly, we need to be guided by the words from Hebrews. In Hebrews 11, 1 we read, Now faith is the assurance of the things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And Hebrews 11, 6 is very important in this context, which reminds us that, And without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists, and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. As He promised in the Chronicles Scripture that we read about, in Romans 15, 13, we read, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. This is our true heritage. This is what we can share with others and our country in its greatest time of need. If each one of us commit to and live our lives in this manner, we are sure to become the instruments in God's hands which He intends us to be. It is when we allow the Holy Spirit to lead us and we become more attentive to His calling upon our lives that we will be able to increase our faith, live in love and abound in hope. And even if a small percentage of us can master this, we will see change in our homes, our communities and ultimately in society at large. It was Gandhi that said, Be the change that you want to see in the world. Dr. Caroline Leaf says the following in her book, Switch on Your Brain. As we think, we change the physical nature of our brain. As we consciously direct our thinking, we can wire our toxic patterns of thinking and replace them with healthy thoughts. This rings very true. Sounds like Dr. Leaf quoted from Romans 12 verse 2, which reads, Do not copy the behavior and customs of this world. Don't the inheritance of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know what God will is for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. In closing, I want to go to the words of Jesus. We read nine, Mark 9 verse 23, Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to them that believe. It is time to change our mindsets and renew our thoughts and ways of thinking. God never intended for us to live according to the world system and the world's heritage and the, world, the way that the world's doing things. He wants us to embrace our heritage and live every day in faith, hope, and love. May God strengthen you through the Holy Spirit to follow this, to embrace your Christian heritage of faith, hope, and love, and to live it physically every day and be what He wants us to be. This we pray, and from me to you, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make turn His face towards you. May the Lord be gracious to you in this time to come. Amen.